Hey everyone, it's Hamish from the Young Investors Podcast. Myself and Brandon are excited to bring you your weekly rundown of the latest business and investing news from around the world. A quick reminder before we get started, any advice provided by Brandon is general and does not consider your financial situation, needs or objectives, so consider whether it's appropriate for you. Brandon van der Kolk is authorized to provide general financial product advice in Australia and is authorized representative number 1305795 of Guideway Financial Services Proprietary Limited, AFSL number 420367. Please see the description box for Brandon's financial services guide. Past performance is not a reliable indication of future investment returns. But with that said, let's get into another episode of the Young Investors Podcast. All right. Welcome back, everybody. Welcome back, Brandon. How are you doing on this uh, beautiful I'm beautiful doing well, mate. Thursday, uh, Thursday at uh, 12 p.m. <laughs> 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 Hamish is getting hungry, everybody. So we got to be quick sticks through this podcast. No dilly dallying. We got to get Let's Hamish to lunch. Yeah. <laughs> How many coffees have you had today? I've had uh, two coffees. Um, so I'm good. Two coffees. I'm good on coffee, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm getting right. hungry. But it's all right because we're talking be about hungry. something um that's that's sad anyway no it's not sad but we're going to talk about how <laughs> we don't want to talk about it yeah we're talking about something that we don't want to talk about <laughs> we're talking about our stock market our investing regrets yeah yeah i the think things uh, that we regret that cost us money that we stuffed up and uh that's yeah. why this podcast is it's going to be quite a short one because uh do you have any uh, um yeah yeah that's uh, it actually we, we have no regrets none at all never all made right. a mistake um, well <laughs> and we're done. <laughs> yeah. No, we definitely have some. Yes, we do. Um, yeah, I think anybody who's been, you know, investing at least for a little period of time has uh, probably made some mistakes. Um, and uh, I think it's important to reflect on things you've done well and things you've done wrong so that you can improve your process. Investing is one of those things you never fully learn. It's always kind of a consistent learning mm. process. So especially looking back at what you yeah. did maybe in the first year or the first couple of years, uh, you'll often find that um, you know you, you've probably done some things that you regret, and so we're going to go through them. Uh, we've uh, each got mm. three investing regrets that we'll be uh, that we'll be talking through, and, and hopefully it'll kind of help. Uh, maybe maybe you can avoid some of these regrets uh, for yourself, whether you're just getting started or, or have been investing for a while. Mm. Yep, so, indeed. I'm excited. Let's do it. With that said, uh, today's episode is sponsored by ShareSite. Uh, which is an application you can use to track the performance of your stock portfolio. Uh, it's fantastic for keeping track of uh, all the different types of gains in your portfolio, capital gains, dividends. If you have dividend reinvestment plans, it will do those calculations for you. Uh, currency gains, if you're, bu- if you're buying shares internationally or you hold foreign currencies. Uh, and then the main reason uh, why I've actually personally been using it for the last few years is for when it comes to tax time. So ShareSite generates up to 12 different reports that can be used at tax time to work out things such as capital gains, dividend income, and more. At the moment, you can try ShareSite for free by heading over to sharesite.com forward slash young investors. That's site spelled S I G H T, sharesite.com forward slash young investors. So use that link. You can sign up to a free plan or you can also sign up to an annual plan. And if you use that link, you'll get four months off uh, off their annual plan. So you, um, it's a significant discount if you want to sign up uh, for a year. So go check it out uh, if you haven't already. Yeah, nice. All right, Hamish. Now we have to start talking about. The bad stuff. <laughs> the regrets. Oh, no. The regrets. I'll go first. Shall I go first? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You go first. I think probably my biggest regret of all the things, all the mistakes I've made is I regret early on trusting other people to do the research for me mm. um, in, various, in various ways, but essentially me just trying to shortcut the research process and not actually doing my due diligence. So uh, an example of this is uh, I followed a YouTube channel called Roger Montgomery. He's a fund manager here in Australia. <clears throat> and he would put out YouTube videos every week uh, saying, you know, pick a stock and why he likes them and why he um, why he'd put them in his fund. And he was very convincing because he, he seemed very smart. He's got his own fund, you know. Um, he spoke like very rationally. Um, for example, one, one time, I think he did a, a episode on why he liked a company called ServeCorp. Uh, now this might've been a stock that would have worked for his portfolio. Probably not cause it just went down, <laughs> but you know, we'll, we'll, we'll run with it. I, I don't know. It, it might've been good for his objectives. It obviously wasn't good for mine. Um, 
it what the company does is it basically just rents office space out around the world, but they don't have like a, a huge number of places, just a, a, a like just a few. Um, and anyway, he would do this YouTube video and he would talk about how you know the company looked poised for expansion, the multiples look good, you know the price is right now, you know get on board, the valuations dropped, you know blah blah blah. He'd he'd talk about all this stuff that he was looking at, <clears throat> and. I went in on the stock in 2017, and this is before I'd discovered Warren Buffett style investing. This is before I'd learned about passive investing. This is just me just trying to turn my money into more money and just speculating essentially. Mm. And this is in 2017, the share price had dropped um, 20%. So mm. it made sense. You know, he was saying, look, it's a, you know, from his perspective, he was saying, look, it's a good company and now the valuation's right. So we got to jump in. Um, so I did. And then what happened? The stock, the stock kept falling and it fell some more and it fell some more. In fact, it's been in cons- – I looked it up just before. <laughs> it's been in consistent decline. It was in consistent decline until 2020. So it's just like three <laughs> straight years of the stock just going Uh-oh. down. So that was, uh, that was not, not a very good um, investment for me. Um, <clears throat> and, yeah, it just shows you that uh, you should not – You should not go outsourcing your research because honestly, like I had no idea. I had no idea about this company. I was just speculating based on what this other guy was saying. And so it dropped 20%. And, you know, if you knew about the company, you would know 20% drop. Oh, this, this just made a good deal better. Or you would know, oof, something's fundamentally changed. I need to get out now. Mm. But I didn't know. And when the stock continued to fall, I didn't know. Was it just getting cheaper? Roger said it was a great company. I guess it's just getting cheaper, is it? I don't know. Ah, and then all of a sudden, you've lost a lot of money. So don't outsource your research. I think that's a that's a, 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 a certainly something I, I've experienced as well, and it's it's. I think it's a really something really important to understand, especially like just take YouTube for example, and people like uh, you know videos you see of people analyzing individual stocks. What you need to understand about YouTube is, you know, the game of YouTube, the person putting the video up, it's about getting views. And a lot of the time, not always, but a lot of the time, people will talk about individual stocks, not based on what they actually think about it, but how popular it is at the time. And that's why you see, you know, a lot of people shifting from talking about, you know, meme stocks to now then talking about cryptocurrency. And they kind of just swing through and their interests just happen to like kind of line up with whatever individual mm. stocks or is types of stocks are doing extremely uh, or are extremely popular. Um, and that's, you know, something you've just got to be, you know, very careful of uh, as well. That's obviously not everyone who's posting those kinds of videos, but, you know, just as like a side note to what you were talking about um, uh, for people out there, just, you know, keep that in mind that the YouTubers, you know, they're trying yeah. to get views a lot of the time. And that's for a lot of YouTubers, that'll be their primary thought over just posting, you know, yep. their own their own research or something. Yeah. Yeah. What's one of your regrets? Yeah. So the first one uh, I put down was uh, regretting being fairly short term focused about around individual stocks when I started. Um, so I, mm. I I started in 2017 as well, um, and fortunately, pretty early on, I also started contributing to index funds pretty early. Um, so I did kind of have that going, but when it came to individual stocks, I was very short-term focused and I'll kind of explain what I mean. Um, so if I look at, when I look back at my kind of portfolio in 2017, I own a lot of different companies. Like there's a lot of different names in there. And when I was buying them, I kind of thought that I was thinking about the company from a long-term perspective. So it wasn't like I was trading these companies. I was kind of uh, thinking about them from uh, like a long-term perspective, but truthfully, deep down, I just didn't know enough about them to believe in them for the long term. So, you know, I, I had mm. one stock, for example, which was Vocus Group, and I was, you know, analyzing it and saying, oh yeah, you know, it'll grow this much over, you know, over the long term, five, ten years. I'll hold this company for a, a decade. I bought the stock. I remember it. I think it was two dollars and forty cents. And within two months, there was a takeover bid at three dollars. Uh, so it shot up to $3, uh, and I just immediately sold it. Um, and there's like a bunch of examples like that in, in, in my portfolio where I kind of thought I had this, you know, long-term mindset, I believe in the company, but as soon as there was a a movement in the stock, either direction up, up a lot or down a lot, it's like the emotion of it kind of took over. And I realized, oh, I don't really know much about this company. 
you know, if it's gone down, I want to get out of it. So I don't, I cut my losses. And if it's gone up a little bit, I want to, you know, take some gains. Um, and I think that kind of mm. mind going through kind of a mindset shift was like a, a away from that and to actually having a long-term perspective uh, was really, really critical. I think in, uh, you know, doing better as an investor over time. There's kind of a, the, the main kind of, I think, foundation of the uh, new mindset that I have now is that uh, Warren Buffett quote about, you know, buy stocks as if the market's going to be closed for a decade. Um, you know, and a lot of people, I remember I used to hear that and just like, oh yeah, I'll buy a stock as if the market's going to be closed for a decade. But now when I buy something, I actually make sure it hits, like meets that test. Like I'm actually buying... Mm things. And I'm going to be so selective and careful about what I own that, uh, if the market really did close for a decade, my, I wouldn't actually feel bad. Like nothing would happen. And I think Mm. a lot of people have stocks in their portfolio where if that did happen, their heart would kind of sink like, Oh no, do I really have to hold some of these stocks for a decade? Um, and I think, you know, that mindset shift, really thinking about it meant, you know, I put way more effort into research I was looking for companies at better valuations. Um, and yeah, I was just way more selective and careful about what I wanted to own. Um, and I think that has made a meaningful difference in, you know, how I've done from the beginning and then, you know, uh, over, over the last few years. Hmm. Yep. I honestly, the second, this is kind of lines up perfectly. The My second regret is pretty much the same thing so i've my second regret i've put here is i regret selling high quality stocks early Mm. and the reason i did this is because i wasn't properly committed to long-term investing um you know as a young guy like you know I, i was not knowing what i was doing um i would get caught up just seeing a short term profit on the table and then just being like oh great and, and locking it in. And I mean, technically, there's nothing wrong. You know, you're doing well. If you're locking in profits, well done, good on you. But I was probably selling high quality stocks way too early. I, I, I And that's so weird because when I, when I bought these, I went in being like, yes, I do. I, I'm going to hold them for a long time. Like I'm, I, I sold like ETFs when I saw a profit. Like, what the hell am I doing? I've only held them for a few months and I'm set. like, what am I doing? Mm. I, I say that in hindsight, but at the time, it's so weird. My brain was like, yes, I'm a long-term <laughs> investor. But what I was physically doing yeah. was ridiculous. Yeah. Um, like I was selling uh, ETF shares. Uh, I sold five thousand dollars worth of my Tesla position, bef- like in just uh, like after a few months, before it had even ten xed itself. Mm. Um, I sold A two Milk early, back when it had it, like just as it had started its massive run. I was like, oh great, I've made some money. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, like, I, I, I've got heaps. It's of so them as bizarre. Well. Yeah, one of my, one of my favorites is uh, I sold Google at fifty a share, which is. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's a wow. That's a that's a fun one. It's uh, as a it's at um 150 now. So and I think again it was like yeah. yeah I bought it and then like two months later I was like yeah I'm just gonna sell this like like even yeah. though you know I the the research that I was doing was you know it's it for the long term um uh but yeah giving it no yeah. chance to actually play out yeah but overall if there's one thing I've learned over the past couple of years. The, the key thing that separates the really successful investors is that they just don't sell the good ones. Yeah. No matter kind of what happens, they, they maintain that ultra long-term view. And if it's still got a long runway, they'll stick with it. They won't sell it. Um, that's very much what Monish Prabhai has been talking about recently. Um, you know, watering, uh, not cutting the flowers. Uh, so yeah, not cutting the flowers to water the weeds, yeah. letting those flowers grow, holding on to the flowers, you know? Yeah. Anyway, what's your next one? My second one is not staying up to date enough with the companies that are in your portfolio and then missing or being late to the party on important changes. Mm. Um, I think, uh, you know, it's, it's, it, it, at, you know, at first you're probably just buying stocks mm-hmm. and not really thinking about it at all, but then kind of the next stage is you probably put in a lot of effort before you buy the stock, but then once you buy it, you just get kind of complacent. It's very easy to do that, especially if the stock is going up. If a stock in your portfolio is going up, 
it's very easy to just kind of say, you know what, everything's going great. Like, I'm just, you know, I don't need to read this quarterly report. You know, I don't need to, you know, look at that news article that had, you know, said they had some legal battle coming up that's critical or something like that. It's very easy just to say, you know, the stock's doing well. Everything must be fine. Uh, it's usually only until the stock starts to fall that you realize, uh oh, uh, maybe I should have been, you know, keeping up with what's happening uh, in the company. And I had this uh, a couple of years ago with a very, uh, with one particular company. Uh, and that was Meta Platforms. Um, so Meta had a huge run up between 2020 and 2021 um, when it was in my portfolio. And it wasn't a massive position, but it was meaningful enough that, uh, you know, there, there's a lesson, I think, in there. And I basically just, you know, it was going up. So I just neglected to look at what was happening in the company. And, and Meta, uh, as you might remember, through 2021 20, uh, and, and 2022, was actually kind of undergoing some pretty fundamental changes. Um, it was shifting. It, mm. it changed from it. Well, it was Facebook back then, uh, when I, when I bought it and mm. it changed to meta platforms and True. you know, that was a branding reflection of a huge shift going on in the business. And I kind of just was very hands off, um, with that. So when the stock started falling in 2022, all of a sudden I was like, Oh my God, I need to figure out why. Um, because you know, part of your, uh, you know, what you have to do as an investor is if, you know, one, the, one of the stocks you owns, is falling or, or a stock that you don't own that you want to own, you have to figure out is something fundamentally changing about the business that makes it now a bad investment or is it just a short-term problem? You know, markets go up and down, people act emotionally. Um, yep. And ultimately I ended up selling the stock in, in 2022. Um, and that's not the mistake. I don't think the mistake is I sold the stock and it's higher today. Um, that's not the regret. I'll kind of get to the regret. I think I had pretty good reasons uh, to, to kind of sell at the time. But I do wonder if I'd been on top of the company earlier and I hadn't kind of rushed to kind of learn about what was happening in the business all of a sudden, I do wonder if emotion would have played a smaller role in the selling of, of the stock. Cause it's, it's really hard to quantify how much emotion played a role and how much was rationale from what I was reading. Mm -hmm. And I think, not looking at the company for a long time, seeing the stock fall, and then suddenly doing a lot of research on it again. I think that may have allowed more emotion to roll into my decision than if I had just been kind of consistently, you know, month by month, staying up to date with, or, or quarter by quarter, staying up to date with the company. Um, I hope that makes sense. I kind of answered that in a weird yeah. way, but um, I think no, as an does. investor, you kind of want to do everything you can to remove emotion from what's happening. And I think- being surprised by stock market declines or surprised by news allows kind of emotion to, to, to seep into your investment decisions. So um, keeping yourself as informed yep. as possible, I think is really important. I think one of the easiest ways for an investor to lose money in the stock market is to just be sitting on a big unrealized gain. Mm. Because you do, I don't know why it, you really shouldn't, but it's I don't know. There's something about it. You're sitting, you're sitting on a big unrealized gain and you go to sleep on the stock. Mm. You just go to sleep. Yep. And then all of a sudden something happens. So inevitably, like no company lasts forever. Inevitably something goes wrong. Even in the biggest companies in the world, every couple of years, something will go wrong and the stock will fall quite substantially. And then you've had this big real, uh, unrealized gain. You're just sitting there holding the stock. You, you've kind of lost, lost track of it. Because you don't have to, right? Because you're up so much on the stock and then something happens, bang, it drops 30%. And mm. then what do you do? Yeah. And then what do you do? Yeah. You don't know because you haven't you haven't kept up to date with it. <laughs> yeah. And I, I always say like the quickest way to figure out whether you know enough about a company is buy it and watch it fall 20% and, and like see how you feel about that. Because uh, <laughs> th that, yeah. that's the quickest way you'll learn. You Because you'll buy something, you'll say, yeah, I know. I know enough about this company. I know what's going to happen. And then it drops 20% and you're like, and, and you feel like selling or you feel like you've missed something. Um, whereas if you're on top of the yeah. business, then you can, you, you know, what's, you generally have a good idea of what's driving the stock down and, you know, whether that's a short or a long-term problem. Mm. You don't know my third one? Yep. What's your third? Not buying Netflix. My third one <laughs> is... <laughs> <laughs> I regret Yours buying not buying, Bit Tesla. not buying Bitcoin when I was uh, in year seven. <laughs> I, re I regret not buying a house when I was in primary school. 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. I really should have bought a house as soon as I popped out of the womb. <laughs> yeah. You know? yeah. I really regret not doing that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, dear. No, my third, my third regret. It's kind of interesting. My second one was I regret selling high quality stocks early. My third one is I regret not selling underperformers sooner. Mm. And I'll, I'll explain what I mean by that because, um, you know, sometimes you can have an underperformer, but you can stick with it and that's fine. But in a lot of instances, I regret not selling the underperformers sooner. So, um, yep. it's true. You don't, you never know what the future holds with, with, with businesses, but, um, if you're sitting there owning some shares that have gone dra- gone down dramatically and you don't understand the company or you just know that there's big problems and you still hold on, that's definitely not the right way to go. Mm. If Even if like, I don't know, there's something about it. Like it's, is it loss aversion, not wanting to actually click the button and lock in the loss? Yeah. That, you know, you get trapped in a mindset of, oh... I'm down thirty percent. They could come back. I'll just I'll just leave it because you know if I lock it in now, then I'm locking in a loss. And they they could come back. You know, so, stocks are volatile. Sometimes they go down and then they come back up. But yeah, if you if you are if the stock is trending down and you don't understand what the hell is going on, then just cut it. Yeah. It's better just to cut it and move on. Yeah. Uh, because you never know if it's gone down 20%, it could still go down the rest of the way. Yeah. You could lose all your money. Um, so if, if, if you feel a 20% loss and then you sell, that might have been a brilliant decision because the company could just go bankrupt. If you don't know, then you don't know. Maybe it will go bankrupt in a month's time. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, my my regret is definitely not selling underperforming stocks sooner. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's it, that. It is a very hard thing to 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 do. Uh, it takes a bit of humility, I think, to to realize. Okay, you know, I thought I knew this company, but I really don't. Uh, and to take a mm. you know take a loss on it. But you're right. It's like it doesn't matter where the stock has been. Like the market doesn't care where you bought it. The market is just pricing it today. And if you don't understand it, it just as much could go down as, as go up. Actually, it's probably more likely to go down <laughs> than go up. Um, uh, so, you know, yeah, I, I think uh, it takes a bit of humility to, to be able to do that. But uh, yeah, it's very mm. important to be able to do it. Classic example for me was Vita Group. Mm. Vita Group, absolute rubbish company. <laughs> it's an Australian company, rubbish company. They ha- they they're one of the few stocks out there that has an anti moat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They have a, they they actually they were reliant on Telstra to generate revenue. Mm. Without Telstra giving them contracts, they did they didn't have revenue. So uh, uh, like rubbish. Um, but I watched their performance tank. I watched their performance tank instead of cutting my losses you know, just taking what I had left and moving on, I just held on. I just held on hoping that they might bounce up again. They didn't. Mm. But for some reason, I couldn't lock in that loss. There was something in my brain that was saying, no, I can't do it. You never know. Just hold it. But no, that's definitely wrong. Just get rid of it, you know. Take what you've still got if you don't understand it. Um and that that's really the key point with this one. It's 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 on stocks that you don't understand because if you do understand it, then you might see a 20% drop and actually be able to acknowledge that, hang on, I can see why it's going down. In the long run, is this going to be a problem? No, I don't think so. And then you can hold through that or buy more. Like that's fine, that's yep. good. But when you don't really get what's going on and then it drops, it's better to just cut it as opposed to like crossing your fingers and just blindly hoping <laughs> it will go back up. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right, Hamish, over to you. All right, my third is... it's pretty similar to, to your first one. Um, yeah, we, I didn't look at yours either before kind of writing mine out. So we've kind of got a little bit of crossover, but right. uh, I regret ever kind of taking stock tips or even just ideas from other people. Um, so yeah, when I was getting started, you know, I was mostly finding ideas from forums and YouTube and, and, and news. And uh, you know, basically it was, you know, oh, someone else thinks this is a good investment. Then I'll look into it personally. Oh, I reached the same conclusion and then I'll buy the stock. Um, and, uh, mm. I think you can get ideas from other people. I, I think a lot of people do cloning and, and not even just cloning, but just farming kind of ideas from, from successful investors and that sort of thing. And, uh, it, I, I think it can from time to time spark ideas, but you've got to be extremely careful. Uh, and it's 
often better to just not do it because you can very easily fall into confirmation bias. Um, Mm. It's actually one of the biggest reasons why I don't talk about individual stocks on YouTube anymore is because I just know that if I say something good about a stock, uh, no matter how much of a disclaimer I I put, I know there's going to be a bunch of people out there (laughs) who are just going to go and buy it or even not even just go out and buy it. They're going to say, oh, I'll look into that myself. And then they'll just, you, it'll just be confirmation bias. Like they'll just be looking and they'll end up reaching the same conclusion through their own research. But ultimately it's that they just trust, you know, the person they're seeing on the screen. They've anchored onto your, yeah, the anchoring effect. They've anchored onto what you said. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, I mean, you know, this is a, this is just kind of a fundamental human trait. Um, So you've just got to, you know, find ways to, to go around that. And ultimately the way that I think about it is, it's kind of going about looking at stocks the opposite way to where I've actually had most of the success. Like it's kind of the idea of mm. starting with a stock that is perceived to be cheap or perceived to be a good investment and then forcing yourself to understand it. Like you're starting with like an idea of this stock is cheap and then just kind of forcing yourself to understand the railway industry or whatever it is, some the energy industry or something new. Whereas most of the success that I've, I've personally had at least has been the complete opposite direction. It's been developing my knowledge in some industries and then just waiting and looking at the stocks in those industries and waiting for something to get cheap in those industries. So like literally just staying within your circle of competence and patiently waiting for an opportunity rather than trying to, you know, fit a square into a circle hole and just, you know, oh, now I'm going to learn about uh, biopharmaceuticals. Like now I'm a biopharmaceutical expert. It's like, no, like, you know, you probably have a couple of areas from your career and your hobbies that you're passionate about. Uh, just go a little deeper on those areas. You're probably, maybe you're a customer in some of those areas and then just wait. Sometimes there's nothing that's cheap in those industries. Um, and sometimes there will be. And that's actually where I've had most of the success rather than, you know, getting an idea from somewhere or something looks statistically cheap. Um, and then just trying mm. to, you know, force myself to, you know. <laughs> become an oil expert or something. <laughs> and the other the other interesting thing that I might just bring up is that I um I do take stock ideas from others, but the way that I do it is that generally the ideas I take are the anti ideas. Mm. So I will through my own circle of competence find the businesses that I'm interested in looking at and then instead of looking for confirmation bias, I'll look for the people that think what I, the company that I'm looking at is terrible. Mm. They, they can teach you a lot because the bears, the bears yeah. will be bears and they will <laughs> let you know everything that is wrong with this company. You know, yeah. the short sellers, they will let you know everything that's wrong with this company. <laughs> and you don't, don't get annoyed at them. Thank them. They're doing you a favor. They're like doing research for you. They're basically handing you on a platter things that could go wrong with your investment. And then you can take that and do your own research on it. You don't do it in a confirming way, like why Tesla doesn't have a demand problem. You know, you just say, uh, go in and research. Okay, a lot of people are saying that Tesla has a demand problem. Is that true? And then go through, you know, statistics from the company. Try to stay away from opinion pieces, but go through statistics from the company, future plans, you know, guidance, outlooks, that kind of thing, and figure it out yourself. Um, so that that's how I use. In uh, Charlie Munger always says to invert. It's inversion. You always got to invert. Yeah, I, I think some people have this idea that well, if these big investors aren't looking at the stocks, then it's probably not cheap because you know what do I know compared to these guys? But I think you've just got to remember there's just so many comp. There's like fifty thousand public companies. Um, you know, and, and each of these guys, you know, they're very successful. They're very good at what they do. But even at the top level, they have particular areas they know very well. And there's areas that they're not interested in. There's areas where the market's too small for how much they're investing because they're putting hundreds of millions at a time or billions into a stock. So I don't think just because, you know, someone, you know, just because Warren Buffett isn't buying it doesn't mean that you shouldn't own it. Um, uh, you know, so I, I think, mm. you know, it's okay to, to, well, I think it's actually a good thing to pick some areas you understand well. And even if no one else is looking at those areas, if you know them well, find the good companies and, and you'll do okay. Thanks everyone for uh, tuning in today's uh, episode. Hopefully you got some value out of uh, hearing about some of our biggest uh, regrets when it comes to (laughs) investing. (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah, our suffering, exactly. Our suffering. Um, as always, if you have any feedback or any questions uh, for, well, yeah, if, we're, we're, we're going to do some uh, Q and A at some point. We'll, we'll weave it into some, yeah, uh, true, some episodes in the in the future. Um, or if you have a topic you want us to talk about or any feedback, um, just let us know on the YouTube version of the podcast and uh, also in Spotify if you're uh, listening on Spotify or watching on Spotify. But uh, with that said, thanks, Brandon, for joining me as always. And uh, we'll be back. We'll be back in the next episode. See you later, guys. Bye. Bye.